Hello everyone. Welcome back to Exploring Quantum Physics. I'm Charles Clark. And now we're going to wrap up the connection between the angular momentum of the Runge lens vector that we saw in a previous lecture and use that to describe the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. So I hope you remember uh, from lectures in the past week we derived this uh, new con the constant of the motion for the hydrogen atom, unusual type, the Runge lens vector, which is really the cross product of the momentum and the angular momentum and the radial vector. And this um, this lies in the same plane as the uh, the radius, uh, same plane as the position of the momentum classically, and def def it, it serves to define the elliptical orbit that the electron and the nucleus make about the center of mass. Well, the classical definition is, is asymmetric in P and L, and uh, precocious young scientist Wolfgang Pauli uh, devised a uh, symmetrized form, and he's, he, he takes the uh, mass out and, and uh, puts it um, in a different area. So as you can see, this, this uh, M vector that Pauli, uh, that Pauli uh, derived is identical up to an overall constant to the Runge lens vector that we derived, but it has a nice symmetric form that is required by quantum mechanics. Well, I invite you to give your opinion on that in the in video quiz. Now, the central result found by Pauli and it's, it seems mysterious and miraculous to me. It has to do with the commutators of the angular momentum operator and the Runge lens vector. So you have already derived this. And since, um, since m is a vector valued operator, uh, it is uh, uh, this. This is uh, this is a consequence. This is the this is the common uh, uh, commutator that applies when the angular momentum operates applied to any vector. But now um, here's the uh, the new one, and I am not going to go through a step by step derivation because it's a lengthy one, but. Uh, as you can see from a, from the from the mechanical point of view, uh, this just involves uh, it now involves the m the m has products of um, uh, p x p. There are triples of momenta and and coordinates in its expressions, uh, so it's lengthy. But when it is done, uh, this this is the answer. And um, as we'll see, these, uh, these identities make it possible to find the bound state energies of all solutions of the hydrogen atom without actually solving the Schrodinger equation. Now first I'm going to talk about the spectrum that's associated with the angular momentum operator itself. It's very important. And um, I'm going to outline the derivation here just because uh, for the interest of time. But it's something that you can do yourself. I've done it. And uh, Zach has written, Zach Raines has written up some nice notes that sort of take you step by step through that. So the first, the first um, observation is that since L3 and L squared commute, and there's nothing important about L3 here, but it's, uh, we know that, that L3, L1, and L2 do not mutually commute, though each one of them commutes with L squared. So uh, we're going to pick, we just by convention, we pick L3 to be, um, we're, we're, going to, we're going to make eigenfunctions that are eigenfunctions both of L squared and of L3, because we can choose to have eigenfunctions that have both those uh, eigenvalues simultaneously. So we'll call these by convention LM, uh, and L3LM 
is uh, uh, is is just the eigenvalues denoted by this. Now it will turn out that L is equal to zero, one, two, and so on integer, and then M is equal to minus L minus L plus one, etc. Up to L. But for the moment, we'll just we'll just leave it undetermined like that. Okay, now, uh, in order to prove the spectral property, uh, this, this is the spectral property of the angular momentum operator, it's, relative, it's straightforward to prove it if you define these two operators, L plus and L minus. These are sort of like, they resemble to some degree the creation and annihilation operators of the harmonic oscillator problem. So you can readily verify this identity because you know it, we're just saying um, you've previously established that, for example, L3 commutator uh, L1 equal IH bar L2. Uh, so it's, it's quite straightforward to verify uh, that uh, th this identity which says, for example, uh, when you when you when you uh, go when you apply when you take this and you now say, all right, let's apply uh, L plus or L minus to this LM. Is it an eigenstate of L three? And indeed, it is. But it has its um, eigen. It, it's, its eigenvalue of L3 is increased by plus or minus 1 times h bar. So, in other words, uh, if, you, if, you, if you start, whatever this state may be, Lm, if you start with Lm, then you get a sequence, so this is the value of L3 here, you get a sequence of um, equally spaced values of, of L3. So the, this is an example of a ladder operator, it's somewhat analogous to the creation of an annihilation operator. Uh, generates a sequence of eigenstates with equally spaced eigenvalues. Well, um, the full analysis requires that this, um, this sequence terminate at some point because if L squared has a fixed value, that means there's a maximum value of the uh, maximum eigenvalue for any one of its components, and um, that that yields uh, th that analysis yields the following result: that the spectrum of the angular momentum operator, uh, it's L squared, the eigenvalues of the form L times L plus one, uh, where L is any uh, non-negative integer, so zero, two. 6, etc. Now there's a widely used um, system of eigenfunctions of the angular momentum operator. Uh, these are called spherical harmonics. Uh, here's, a, here's an appropriate reference for their properties. And uh, they're expressed in spherical coordinates. So basically if you have a, fu a function in three-dimensional space, um, the, the spherical harmonics are used to parameterize the angular dependence. So by convention, this is this is x three, the z coordinate, uh, phi is the is the uh, as it moves the angle, the theta the conventional polar angle. And uh, here is a an image that shows the various um, the various. Uh, so for l equals zero, there's m equals zero only. For L equal 1, there's M equal plus 1, 0, minus 1, and so on. Now, uh, I think it's useful to keep in mind that YLM is, is basically a polynomial of degree L divided by R to the L. So all all these these functions, I mean, their their expressions can get pretty complicated, but you can always think of them as polynomials. So, for example, 
y0 is 1 over root 4 pi. It's just a constant. It's just a constant function. Um, y uh, 1, 0, and minus 1 are, well, y 1, 0 is proportional to cosine theta, which is, so it's proportional to z over r. And y 1 plus or minus 1 are proportional to um, x plus or minus i y over r. So they're, um, they're, the, the things that, the most problems that you encounter uh, just deal with fairly small values of L, whereas the, uh, the, uh, the spherical harmonic functions are rather simple. But they're a very powerful set. And they're often, they're widely used in, in many applications in physics and mathematical analysis. Now, it turns out, to get back to the, um, the angular momentum and runge lenz uh, vectors, these operators, L and M, together, let's just think about the bound states of hydrogen for the motion, uh, together, they're the generation, they provide the generators of a rotation group in four dimensions. So the hydrogen atom has an internal symmetry which is like the symmetry of an object that has particular uh, transformations under rotations in a space of four spatial dimensions. Uh, it's quite extraordinary that such a deep relationship exists. Now, I don't think it's possible in, to make a interpretation of that fourth spatial dimension that's something that exists like one of the three spatial dimensions with which we're familiar. But it is uh, striking that this, this very basic dynamical system, the hydrogen atom, the simplest atom, has this very rich and symmetric structure with a high degree of degeneracy. So um, for, um, uh, for, a given, for a given value of, of principal quantum number, let's say n is equal to uh, n, n plus l plus 1, there are n squared states with the same energy. So this degeneracy receives, I think, spectacular confirmation in this data from the molecular cloud that we uh, saw in an, an earlier lecture. So uh, this frame shows absorption uh, by states in a molecular cloud uh, with an n value of 600. And uh, the, there, are, there are basically something like 300 and for, for in this region, there are 350,000 states with the same energy, and there, well, there are 350,000 states in this vicinity, and you see sharp lines uh, here, and these are, according to our best understanding of the system, those states are all equally populated. So you're seeing this sharp ringing. All of these hundreds of thousands of states are making transitions at, at exactly the same frequency. It is really, it's really quite a remarkable thing. Indeed, without this high degeneracy of the, uh, th these are actually um, carbon-like atoms with a, um, with a highly excited electron, so they're hydrogenic. Without that exact degeneracy, we wouldn't see these signals at all. So um, we're going to conclude for the moment there and then uh, proceed in the next lecture with some um, discussion of more applications of angular momentum. Hope to see you then.